very much to um, the Amity Global Institute space here in Singapore. I'm very pleased to see so many people on a, on a Saturday morning. Um, hopefully we've all had our coffee. You're ready for lots and lots of questions. Um, thank you very much for, for coming here um, to the event on the effects of AI and digital disruption on the workplace. We've got a couple of excellent speakers and I hope we're going to get some good debate going. Um, the university um, very much is about training and preparing the leaders of tomorrow for the global economy. And I think as we will find out, the, the changes um, that are happening in the workplace are going to have uh, long reaching effects that we don't yet know about. Um, AI dramatically altering, is altering corporate practice as we speak. How can we stay ahead of that? How can we prepare? Is it through education? Is it through learning? Is it through discussion? We shall see. So today's event will explore the challenges and advantages of integrating unfamiliar technologies in the workplace, um, helping us all understand the development of AI integration. Before we head on to Alex, who's going to uh, change our minds and <coughs> views on everything, I'd like to introduce a very special guest, uh, Professor Robert Zimmer. Professor Zimmer is the head of computing at Goldsmiths University of London. He studied at MIT, Cambridge and Columbia, where he received his PhD in mathematics in 1985, including nuclear reactor protection systems. He's gone on to research such varied subjects as artificial intelligence and digital art theory and practice. Professor Zimmer, would you like to say a few words? Right. I want to echo the, 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 the sentiment about it. It's a fantastic seeing people coming out on a Saturday morning. Uh, I just I just want to say a couple of, a couple of things. I've, I've been an AI researcher for many years, since probably before some of you were born, uh, and, and teacher. And AI has changed enormously in that time. When, when I first was doing teaching AI, it was much more about what was called symbolic AI, which is trying to model the kind of thought processes that, pe that, that people had. So we had, we had ideas about uh, linguistic analysis and, and, and uh, something called expert systems, which I think is the height as a phrase. And there, it was all about trying to th get computers to think on a symbolic level the way computer, the people do. At the time, there was what was, what was bubbling up at the, at the idea was, at the time, was an idea that you also can get computers that sort of work the way brains work which, in terms of in, in terms of making connections and modeling neural about what's happening in, in the neural networks in your brain instead of the thought processes directly. And that was quite a small thing at first, but it's entirely taken over. And so that's what AI and people mean by AI. And AI is so much more important than we ever thought it was going to be. As, as in all, with all over the place. And we sort of thought it might be, but we didn't really believe it. And now it's, uh, we'll find out more about that. And we, we in, t in terms of how important AI and computing is, and how much it's changed, uh, we have we've taken that on board as the University of London teaching globally. And I want to just talk to you very briefly about the reasons I'm in Singapore. I'm very glad to be at this event, but that's not why I flew over from London. Uh, I flew over because I'm here representing two new initiatives we have at the University of London work with Singapore partners. One of them is with, we're up big, the big, is with Amity, we, we have a science for, and the, the one with Amity is, under, is an undergraduate program, which is a very exciting new undergraduate program. It's the first undergraduate program on the Coursera platform. So it's, it's, it's got, already got, we just, it's launching next week, I don't know, it's more longer in two days, it's launching on Monday, and we've already got over 600 people who signed up for it, just without any teaching institutions, teaching center support. It's supposed to be a soft launch, we expect 150, we got 650. It is an enormous, enormous uh, appetite for this. And one of the ways is really exciting is that we, it's very modern, and there's, there's, there's several, particular special specialities, one of which is artificial intelligence and machine learning. Another one that's, that might be relevant to some of you here is, is data science, but which has some of the same, uh, the same machine learning ideas in it. And, but the thing is, what we've done 
is as well as having a whole BSc program, we're setting up ways for people who already have degrees to just reskill, re re learn new materials by doing what we call a graduate certificate or a graduate diploma. That's set for people who already have degrees, like all of you, and they just, you just do part of the program, depending, some, probably nothing from the year one of the program, uh, some of year, a little bit of year two, and the specialisms from year three, and you can get a certificate, a graduate certificate doing it that way, and if you also do the project, you get a graduate diploma. So that's a way of you becoming ready to work in the world Alex is about to explain to us if you, if, by taking what you've already done is with your degree and kind of uh, building on top of it. The other thing we're, we're here, I'm here presenting is, um, is a master's program in data science. Uh, and that's not at MIT, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, that's at the Singapore Institute of Management, SIM. Uh, and I'm actually going to, this afternoon, I'm going to be at an event at the Risk Carlton. The Risk Carlton. So if anybody's interested in finding out more about that master's, please come along to that. But that's a master's program in data science, but it's got two specialist streams as well. One of them is data science and financial technology some of you might be interested in. And the other one is data science and artificial intelligence. So again, just, just up the Alex's street. So it, that's another way of taking your undergraduate degree and becoming more ready to work in, 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 in this world that Alex is going to explain to us. So I'd love to see some of you in the, in the, this afternoon. I'd love to see some of you as our students at, at, at Amity. Right, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And not just subject matter, but at different levels. So the, the new BSc, I mean, as you just said, I mean, we are very excited about that. You know, we haven't even done a hard launch for that yet. The, the Masters in Data Science, is that what you're working on with us, Eddie? Are you supporting on that? No. But, but, okay. What's the course you're working on? The supply chain. Supply chain management. So there are a number of interlocking um, subjects. And in many cases, um, you have different parts of the university. We have our alumni who are involved in speaking on that. And 20 years ago when Alex, or 23 years ago when Alex graduated, <laughs> sorry about um, <laughs> was AI even sort of, and the internet only really just started. And uh, so, you know, you can see in, in 20 years what has happened. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alex Chan, uh, the CEO of Balabox. Um, Alex is a, a graduate of the University of London and a successful mm -hmm. entrepreneur. Uh, recently caught the world's attention by launching, launching one of the world's most advanced AI video search engines. He's a pioneer in the field of video big data and regarded as a knowledge leader in a rapidly growing segment. Companies like Rico, Procter & Gamble are forming global partnerships with his team to create various forms of video AI platforms. He's over 20 years of experience sorry, mate, in the technology <laughs> sector and past work has won international awards. In his spare time, Alex co-authored an Amazon best-selling book series which involved himself in various capacities with organizations like UN Women. We are very pleased to have Alex uh, come and talk to us. We'd like to have him answering lots of very tough questions. So please get involved, but without further ado, Alex. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, name is Alex Chan. So, as, as you said, 1996. Yeah, that's a long time ago. And, and you're right, AI at the time wasn't even a, wasn't, it was a term, right? But it was a very, very, a term where Number one, we don't really associate with it now because at the time the big thing was the internet. It was just we we're just talking about it, dialing up the modem and all these things. And at that time when I was doing the, the course, I don't think it's uh, things have changed that much, but I was pretty known for one thing, which is falling asleep. But yet after I wake up in the lecture, I'll ask questions. Right. So today <laughs> two key topics. One, falling asleep. So my job today is to try to keep you guys awake during this session. And number two, if you have any questions. Please, uh, just fire away, right? So, before I go on, I'll just explain a little bit of what I, who I am, right? Not, these are things that normally I don't do in studios because I only talk about, mostly these are talks about work, but I've got uh, five companies, likely to spin up another one, right? Uh, so far, I've exited some, so I, some I had fun with, um, some I actually is for, um, one or two companies actually for sold, right? 
uh, with interest and all this. So it's nothing to do with IT. Some of them have nothing to do with IT. I've developed uh, quite a number of brands out there. Uh, some of them you've probably never heard before, but uh, some of them you might have. If you are in my field, chances are you might have heard of us. Right. Uh, yeah, n nine books we co authored with a friend of mine. So it's something that I really wanted to do. Uh, I sort of discovered that when I was, I was uh, in 1999. So it took me like 12 years to start doing the first book. And we spent uh, quite a lot of time volunteering as well, uh, different kind of organizations. Uh, you see the word Manchester, that's because uh, currently now I am the uh, president of the Manchester Alumni, Singapore chapter in Singapore. I did my master's in Manchester. Um, funny story here is that the degree that you that I had uh, with, uh, with UOL, I actually got uh, entry into LSE as well. But uh, during the time, I, I couldn't afford London because London was very expensive with exchange rates. At that time, it was crazy. Um, so I sort of rejected that. I wrote a letter, letter. I wrote a letter back, not email, I wrote a letter back to say thank you very much for the offer. And I got a phone call back two years back and said, hey, well, we, we just want to check you know, whether we, 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 we really actually rejected our offer. Because at the time, I mean, rejecting an offer for LSE, you know. But I, said, I told them I couldn't afford London. And we, we talked through a quite, a, quite a lot of things and sort of realized they don't get rejections very much. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, the point here is this, I think with the degree like, from UOL, I was able to go to a lot of places. So I think this is something that is uh, very much life changing. I'm, I'm also a father, so I've got two kids, right? So I know I'm not cool because they're in the teens now. So father, I'm not cool. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so this is me uh, uh, in somewhat of a complete view, um, right? So before we begin, I just want to run through something. I just want to run through this. Um, this, this. This is the world map. And, and this is the world as we know it. This is something very, very familiar, right? But, but what if I tell you, actually the world, actually the world map actually looks like this, right? It's, it's a lot longer, right? It's a lot longer and it's, it's, it's out, it seems out of proportion. Or if I tell you the world map actually looks like this, different. So down under is no longer down under, it's actually up and above. So, so question here is what is wrong with the first map? Actually, there's a lot of things that's wrong with the first map. In fact, almost everything, right? For example, Africa is 14 times larger than Greenland, but yet it looks on the same size, so on and so forth. Europe is, looks larger than North Africa, but actually the reverse is true. But the point here is this, I mean, we, we, we this, these are facts. You, you can't deny this, right? And, but the, so the issue here is, the question here is, why the heck are we still using the first map? To be honest, I'm not sure. <laughs> right? But the point here is this, if, if you don't learn anything beyond this point, right? at least you know the map that you're looking at is, is not, is, is, uh, uh, the facts are not right. But I think um, it, it says a lot of things, right? Like for example, the, the, the keyboard typewriter that we're using, right? I said typewriter, you know, the keyboard that we're using, the QWERTY keyboard is, not the most efficient, right, and historically, but yet we are still using it. It just goes to show that human change is actually very difficult for humans, right? Because we've been using the world map for a long time to change it. It's a radical change, right? But yet, we, even though we know some facts are true, but yet we don't change. So it says a lot, actually. It actually says a lot about human society. So hopefully, what we like is um, you know to really think about it and to when, when you sit here you think you have a different perspective of things that's that's i think you if we can open up your, our minds open up our hearts as well to have a slightly different perspective right and this is where we have a conversation going on right i mean i'm, I'm not here just to give you something but hopefully i'll be able to get back um, for the things as well as we ask questions and, and so on and so forth so i think uh, this is actually what we are at. And it's important, it's very important to have a, to be able to have a different perspective on things, right? So, so as, as I look at the title itself, a couple of keywords, right? So the effects of AI digital disruption at workplace. So there are a couple of things. Uh, if, you, if you run this through AI, right, chances are you will be able to pick up the word uh, AI, maybe digital disruption and workplace. So these are what we call text analytics AI, by the NLPs. But, but chances are they won't understand the word effect because this is what the talk is really about, right? So I, so I thought about it, okay, so what are we gonna talk about? So 
basically, of course, we are going to go through a little bit of AI. And what is this job destruction? So just in case we, we need to cover the bases. And of course, I think the workplace. How is it going to affect you? And more importantly, how is this going to affect your career? Right? Um, some of, I noticed that some of us are still going into a career, right? Building a career. Some of us are perhaps looking for a second career, right? The second career part, in a way, is very important, important, or even the third career. Because uh, as we go along, let's say, for example, I'm 20 years, like 20, more than 20 years in this, right? So we are constantly going through disruption after disruption. So it's very important to keep a different perspective, open your mind up, and move into uh, another industry. Um, uh, we have a researcher here who does actual AI, right? For me, I would say that I'm more of a practitioner. So we use lots of AI, put it into practical practices. But it's the same. I think it's very important to recognize where the world is going, right? And if you recognize that, and the only question here is what you're going to do with it. So right now, uh, I'm just going to go through a little bit about what I think about technology. So this is this chart. Uh, it's a mind map, actually. I, I sort of had to do this in a slide because the original was pretty messy. Right, um, I was actually asked a couple of years back, is technology good or bad? So it sort of set me thinking, technology good or bad? Yeah, there's always both sides of the, of the coin, right? So I, I decided that instead of looking at the good or the bad, I decided to use, to have the word use and abuse, right? So I, this is important because I'm in IT, right? And I have to think about whether technology is good or is it bad. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, I got to a, I came down to a conclusion that technology will eventually kill us. It will. It will absolutely eventually kill us. Uh, well, that's my point, right? Uh, for, for a very, very, very simple reason. And it appeared three times on my, on my map, my map. And that's scale. Right? And that's scale. It's very simple, right? Um, we, so, so, the, we have sort of decided that today, and if technology is going to kill us, that's, that's the end of, end of human time. But that's not the point. The point here is that there's still a long time between here and the end of time, end of our time. So in between this, there's a lot of things that we can do and there's a lot of good that we can do. And hopefully when we reach there, nobody press that button, right? So why scale? It becomes very important where we sort of realize as we go into AI and, and when we're going to the IR 4.0, if scale and speed becomes critical, right? We, we I sort of realized that um, we, we can do very good, but yet we can do very bad because all you need is that one guy, one person to develop that one system and develop that one particular button. And when you press that button and the button is not reversible. So that is the scary, really, really, really scary part, right? But like I said, before the time to get there to this one single button, there's a lot of things we can do or even prevent that from happening. And that really depends on all of us, right? And to recognize the fact that, it's, that there is a danger of that happening. So recently, I think there's uh, quite a number of uh, you know, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg coming out to say that you know, AI is dangerous and all these things. And I absolutely agree with that. Absolutely agree with that. Um, simply because of the word scale. And as we move along now, it's going to double up faster and faster. So the scale is actually what scares me. And not that technology doesn't really scare me, but the, the scale of it scares me. So um, I think this chart is, is just a little chart about disruption to explain a little bit about where we are. Right? So this is a tiny little thing that says artificial intelligence. So this is today. right? So today, where we are, we are in machine learning. Um, so if you if you go back to this, this is uh, industrial revolution, right? And this is where mass production. But at any at every point in time, at every point in time, there's disruption everywhere. So when Henry Ford came up with the car, you know, then if you're uh, if you if you're uh, doing horse carriages, then what happened? You have trouble, right? Because the car is coming. So throughout time, disruption has been happening. Technological disruption has been happening. So digital dis disruption is just another term which is probably a little bit more 
um, appropriate right now, the word digital. But the, the word disruption has been around for a long time. And you have to recognize that disruption is happening every day. The only thing that is constant is change. Right? So, so in a certain sense, we really have to be on the edge of our seats. Uh, thinking about, or at least not every day, but at least you have to put some thoughts into what's going to happen in the next five years, ten years, and what you do, and, uh, and what you're going to do, things like that, right? So, so right now, we, we are going towards a very exciting era, with, especially because with AI, with all the things that's happening. And, and the next real big things will be things like uh, autonomous systems, uh, you have a central brain and things like that, right? And but but is is we'll, we'll see what happens with the shape of it, right? Because uh, there's uh, 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 there's a lot of work that's being done, right? But I think we if we take a step back, it's like uh, at this point in time, I think we are trying to grow a child, right? Uh, values becomes very important. Uh, the laws has to govern all around it to so called safeguard. But on the other hand, we also need to be a bit bullish and a bit, I would call it cowboy, to really try things out. Right, so this is this is it, right? This is the reason why AI and digital disruption is important, because this is at our point in time. Again, the question here is what you have to do about it. Right, you have to recognize this. So AI. Um, I just want to I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the time when I was uh, really shocked with uh, AI and, and it sort of hit me, right? Because there are a lot of news coming up and, and when things like that I care about uh, uh, came out in the news, I, wa I was absolutely shocked. So in, um, in 1997, I was actually working in IBM. So when, when IBM came up with the Deep Blue and it defeated uh, in 1997, maybe some of you guys are still kids. <laughs> <laughs> but in 1997, when uh, in IBM Deep Blue defeated uh, Kasparov, right, uh, and chess, I said, wow, it's amazing, right? I, I remember the time where IBM was celebrating and all these things. So that was great. But it didn't really, it didn't really dawn on me about the importance of it until much later. Of course, like I said, much later was uh, 2015, 2016, when AlphaGo defeated, uh, uh, AlphaGo defeated the, the, the Go champion. Right. So this this was when I sort of realized, oh my God, this is coming, this is crazy. So why why was I surprised? Because I play both things, both games, chess and go. Go is a lot more complex, a lot harder than chess. A lot. It's, so if, if you guys know go, is fighting by ninety square, quick, right? So the first move, first two moves, you are only limited in a chess move. You are limited by twenty moves. But in a, in a go move, you're limited by 361. So on the chess board, right? So as you go along with the permutations and all these things, the, the vast, the search space for go is, is said to be greater than the atoms in the universe. I, I'm not too sure, but maybe there's some sort of, uh, uh, the statement is, 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 may not be true, but I think, right, it's not that far. It's crazy amount of combinations. So when, when, in terms of AI, whoever has done that, you, you, you will realize the significance of this. So that was in a way, I thought, okay, 2015, I really wasn't in AI then. I thought, like, okay, we've got to do something about this. It's, come, it's coming, right? The big boys are in it. It's going to push the entire industry because AlphaGo is done by Google. So that was the time when I sort of really, really, really realized that AI is going to come. It's going to hit us hard. Um, so I think it's, it's also important to recognize, just, just have an overview of the different kinds of AI that we have now, that we have. Right? Well, this is what we call, the first one is what we call uh, narrow AI, ANI, right? So narrow AI, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen this, if you're on the food court, you have got this tray. So narrow AI means that it does one thing and that one thing very, very well. Uh, currently now, most of the AI is what, what I would call transactional. Meaning that you do something, you do, uh, like for example, you do a trade, you have some vision, and, and that's it. It doesn't do anything else, and, and that's AI. Uh, but currently now, I think we are in a 2.0, narrow AI 2.0, where you are what we call using a multi-model approach, using multiple kinds of AI, going into a single, uh, trying to solve a single problem. Like for example, driving. Driving is a multi-model, uh, it's AI, it uses LiDAR, it uses radars, it uses 
but yet you need to know the depth of X, so on and so forth, right? It uses multiple types of AI to, <coughs> to go into, uh, to solve a, a more complex problem, but it, only, but it still does only one thing, which is driving, right? So this is the age that we are at now, um, and of course, you, the next kind of AI would be what we call a general AI. This is where it try to make, make, mimic uh, humans, right? Um, and, and you've seen robots doing this. But this kind of uh, what we call general AI, it's, um, I, I believe it's still pretty far off. 20 years, 30 years, or even 50. It's for a very, very simple reason, right? Um, Fujitsu came up with a computer, a computer called K, right? Uh, it took 82,000 processors in 40 minutes to simulate one second of brain activity. 82,000 processors in 40 minutes to process one second of brain activity. So you see what's the problem here. 82,000 processors. So 82,000 processors, you need power, right? So you, anytime soon, you're not going to put 82,000 processors into a single machine that is linked up to some sort of power or battery pack to power that up, right? You so it, that it needs not just uh, the, the software, the neural networks to, to run that, but you need actual power technology. You need processors to be to be nano, to to be to be uh, miniaturized, right? Into to squeeze into that that small little compact thing called the body. So yeah, I, I don't think it's anytime soon, right? If you really want to mimic a person's behavior, right? But Probably we will be able to achieve that. When not sure, right? Uh, there's a lot of work done on this, right? Um, but I, I, I think at this point of time, you don't really have to worry too much about this. But just to be real, just to be, um, uh, how do you say, uh, prepared that this might happen. So this is the other one, right? The super intelligence, right? So I put this Star Wars because um, in a uh, C3PO, he does 6,000 languages, uh, 6 million languages, uh, and he's able to, so basically super AI means that it's better than human, right? It's superhuman. But there's a problem. What if it's a, so we have a human, what if a human is better than, that machine is better than you? So, so does he replace you? Probably you can. So the brains are better, everything is better, right? So, so this, this, um, we're not sure whether how far this would go. Um, maybe it's not even achievable. But these are the stuff of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So we leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave the Star Wars stories behind and, and we just leave it, right? So I think right now, I, I think it's good to just have a sense of what what AI is really about. And and like I said, we are, I'm more of a practitioner, right? On, on this, I I've actually carried, uh, prepared a sort of little demo. So just let me get into that. Oh, okay. So this is depending on the camera that I have. Um, so so I, I think it's the lighting is not good, but but essentially this is what it does. Right? So for the faces that you can sort of capture, this is what we call uh, narrow AI. Right? So you can get uh, if you can't you can't see. So this is male with gender, right? You can see the age, right? And in, you will be able to see whether it's happy or sad. So I'm I'm able to track you the time you sit down and, and tell me exactly uh, how you feel about my talk, right? Because at the end of the talk, if you're gonna have a form, right? And you tell me, oh, right, the form, how do you do the speaker, one, two, three, four, and they say five, fantastic. But it's only that point of time, right? But if, if I do this, I can track you, I'll know exactly how you feel every second. Right, so what this also means that the the level the num amount of data that you get from a form is just one form, but the amount of data that we will be able to generate through that will be throughout the entire talk. Right, so so this is this is a very typical kind of a very typical kind of AI where it's um, where you have cloud analysis. So when you uh, cloud analysis means what, right? Um, Right, we, we didn't put any facial recognition, so I don't know who you are. We got, we're not going to keep the data, right? But just for the sake of uh, just for the sake of that demo. So this is actually here. So far, uh, in terms of uh, the reactions, have been somewhat positive. Is the green? I don't know who. I'm a little bit sad about the, the red part, but uh, 
it's inevitable. So but I will also know some sort of demographics over here. So look, in a in a sense, um, nobody can really do this. The, the, the tr traditional way of doing this is somebody sitting at the door with a small little counter, with a small little clicker, and you walk through and say, okay. But they won't be able to tell you whether male or female, unless you have two clickers and say one male, one female. But they, even if you do one click, two clickers, you won't be able to tell you whether this guy is happy or not. Right? So if you look at it from that perspective, yeah, it's good. Because it helps you to gather data, to have insights of, of the, the crowd, of the people. Um, so this is a, a typical kind of AI that, uh, that... This one is actually considered simple, actually. But, uh, maybe I can actually also show you what we sort of do. For this, I'll sort of do Right, um, I can do another demo. This is uh, a, a demo that, uh, this is uh, so-called something that I did way back in the end of 1990s, uh, no, end of 2016. This is uh, Donald Trump versus uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, debate, presidential debate. So at the time, it was, this, is, this is an alpha demo. So this is really old, right? But uh, one of my friends actually, he, knew of what, what I was doing. So he asked me, hey, can you do this? Uh, I said, oh yeah, sure I can, right? Because he's from US, he's American actually, and he's sort of a journalist. So that, that is sort of helpful. So just to explain a bit what we, what we can do with this. So um, uh, we, this is a video search engine. So there are three videos, there are a couple of videos inside here. So what I'm gonna do is I want to search word. Say for example, word disaster. Okay. So what, what this search engine is supposed to do is I'm going to look for the word disaster and I will be able to tell you the number of times the word has been said, who said it, and when it's been said. So if you think about it, currently now, it's very difficult to search videos because the, the, this library. You go to any library, are you able to search videos? Because you can search the indexes and all this for books and because it's text, it's easy. So what we're tackling here is that we are searching videos. Right? And one of those things that we are actually using, one of the AIs that we're using, we use speech recognition to search the video. So if we click on this link, it will go to exactly where it's been said, so on and so forth. I'm not going to click it because like, it's, it's a video. right? It will take a bit of time to go. I, I will do another demo. This is uh, a step forward, um, and this is what uh, a lot of our, our work has been done. This is what we call translated video search, meaning that we are able to search a video that is not is in a, in a language they do not understand. Look, um, the reason why we're tackling this is quite simple, because uh, in terms of knowledge, right? Knowledge has two limitations. The first limitation is where it is. Because if you, let's say for example, this library here, right? And if the videos are in the library, you have to come here to look for the videos, right? And if you do not know, if it's not indexed, it's not searchable, then you really have to scroll up and down to see where the videos are, right? So this is what happens when you go to YouTube and all this, and you, you have to go to a exact point. And when you do a research, that's even more problematic. So what we'll, uh, the second limitation here is that the knowledge is uh, kept uh, it's limited by it's not, uh, by the language itself. So if you don't understand German or you don't understand Greek and you want to know a little bit about Greek history, but you only know English, so what are you going to do? Chances are you won't find it because you don't know the Greek word. So what we are trying to do here is we, we, we will use the language that we know to look for another video in another language. So for example, you, you see uh, a search for a president with 27 results and like I said, there's no audio, but I'll see what it can play. So this is um, President uh, Pianetto, right? He, he only speaks Spanish. He doesn't speak English. So what we do here is that uh, we, 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 we use speech recognition, right? To understand what he says in Spanish, we translate that, we index it, we did a bunch of things to it, and then we present it. So this is an application of AI. As, so uh, the, the, approach that we, uh, the approach that we are 
using we're using multi model approach, meaning multiple AIs to solve a single problem. So for example, if, if we look a little bit bigger, right? We know that he actually said the wall four times. He mentioned United States four times. But that is in Spanish. Right? So we use that approach. So imagine if you are a global company. And a global company has many offices. And they all speak different languages. Right? And you're, you want to do a say, for example, a market survey. And the market surveys and you survey the need, uh, people, but they all speak in the native language. But let's say, for example, we're here in Singapore, we only speak English. How are you going to do a global survey? You have to go to region, right? You have to ask different questions, but they are in the native language. So what 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 we can do now is we actually normalize and put it into a single language, and the results will be in a single language. It, well, if you put it that way, then it's, it's really about trying to be able to open up knowledge, to open up knowledge to different parts of the world. Uh, and extend it beyond your, your, the barrier that you have, which is the limitation that the knowledge has, which is, which is um, the video in itself, the format, and also the language. I hope, I hope I'm not losing you guys. <laughs> All right. but, uh, but this is what we sort of do, and, uh, and if you look at clearly at the results, this is in Spanish, right? Um, and we have. This is actually in Portuguese, and we have uh, Mandarin, Xiaotian, and then we have another of his videos. So my, my point here is this, we, we are able to, we are, right now we have come to a point where actually we use different kind of AI to, to help people, right? Of course, when you say help, it also means that, remember I said the word use and also can say the word abuse. So it really depends on how the application is. So. Um, so, so I, I, I won't do any more of these demos, but uh, I'm just saying, showing that uh, the, the next need, right, of things that we can do with AI in order to help the things that we do. So in this case, for example, would really be, we know that um, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that we can do in education, a lot of things, imagine, because today there's a lot of work, uh, a lot of um, so-called lessons are actually being transmitted through videos, right? So question here is, how do you extend this video in another language and make it available? Because that's knowledge, right? Um, we also know that uh, there's a lot of work that we can actually do with, let's say, for example, museums and libraries, so on and so forth. So these are the markets that we, we believe that are, uh, that are very worthwhile going into. But of course, then again, wow, you know, these guys' videos, then who are the biggest ones? Of course, you know, they have the intelligence of the top, you know, the, the different agencies who are interested in this, things like that. But um, I think that's the world we live in now. Right, um, people are watching. <laughs> All right, but yeah, um, I think I think we're just having a conversation. If if you have, um, uh, so there is a line where we have to really think about uh, not in terms of uh, just as a citizen, as a policy, not just a local citizen, but a global citizen about thinking about this kind of things. Um, uh, the level, of the, what what we want the, our world to, to go into, work with. Work with. I think that's very important. <coughs> right. Okay, I shall go back to my set of slides. Right. Uh, so far, are there any questions? Uh, what you do is just stop me. Right. So, right. The important part now, jobs. Um, I, I was, like I said, I wasn't really sure uh, until I look at the audience to see the, a group of what we do. But I think there are two groups, I guess, literally. I mean, we have the 90s, 1990s, and the 2000s and 30s. But, so I think it's important how this is going to impact uh, AI and the level of disruption, how it's going to impact us, right? Um, we know at the workplace that we are using a lot of technology already, but, but essentially, where are we going? What kind of jobs uh, would we really, really be, be doing in days to come? Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the kind of Disruption field, and this is critical. It's not just it's not just a matter of um, uh, computing power and all this, but this is actually talking about data. Now, this chart shows you the amount of data that we will generate, we will generate, or are already generating, is exponential. It's going up, right? So, this these are the big gaps here now. So, this study says that uh, there's, in terms of data, 
Only 1% is analyzed, right? And only 20% is secure. Um, so if there's a career tip, I will say this. <laughs> no, uh, data science and cybersecurity. So if you are thinking of doing uh, a data scientist, a great opportunity because I, yeah, in, in, the, in the field that we are doing, working on now, there's so much data to be analyzed, right? You don't need to get your data science exactly as a data scientist, but you work around data. If you work around data or work with data, you'll be secure, you'll be okay, right? Of course, security as well. Data security, you, yeah, okay, I'm not in cyber security and all these things, but you can work with systems that, that is on, on security or cyber security. Right? So these are two key industries, I think, within tech that is absolutely needed and is absolutely lacking. And, uh, and of course, people a lot of ask me why, just now you saw the search engine that we're working on, right? I'll just give you a, a small little application of how, how I think and why I think that the, how I actually work with data. Right? So people are always ask me, ask me hey, um, search engine, isn't Google doing that already? So yeah, sure, Google is already doing that because they, but currently now, Google's search index is only for web pages and uh, uh, text kind of uh, uh, data. So, so they don't have, you, they don't have videos. They don't do videos, but they have something called YouTube, right? They have something called YouTube. And every year, YouTube uh, has about 18,000 worth, 18,000 years worth of video uploaded every year. 18,000 years of video uploaded every year, right? So if let's say, imagine if let's say um, Google start indexing, meaning that they start uh, making it searchable, it will be this amount of data. So assuming, because I don't know actually how much, but I can tell you for sure, the amount of video data that we have today is actually upstream what web pages data have, okay? So assuming that it's in one language. So, so right now, if we translate that into 100 different languages, this is the amount of data that Google has to store and back up and this is 20 cedarbytes by the way. So uh, terabyte, terabyte, cedarbyte, right? So this is 20 cedarbytes. It's, it's, and it's just Google, right? We, we have not even talking about Bing, we're not talking about anything else. But there's one big problem. We all expect it to be free, <laughs> right? We all expect that to be free. So, so I said, okay, forget it. This is not my market, right? But I have a bunch of this. There are millions of organizations with videos. So this is how I think. Right? So relating back to the realization that the videos are not the, the amount of data that you'll be generating. If I can do this, I'll be okay. I, I don't need the entire thing, I just need a small little portion. Right? So so the ability to think about where where the world is going in terms of uh, very specific and getting into, it doesn't just have to be a job, but for me, it will be a market, the segment that we're in. So this is, like I said, this is how I think, it's just a demonstration. Um, because I got asked this a lot, and I realized that, okay, I've got to, I've got to ex sort of explain this. So this is a chart that I did uh, maybe last year or something like that. By the way, the numbers are probably quite way off, because the numbers, this is, I think about five, six years ago. So it's probably double or something like that. So it's ever increasing. But it's, it's crazy the amount of data that, uh, that we have. Right, I, I, I think right now it's important to, to realize that what, I, I use robots, right? <laughs> but it's not robots, right? it's just AI. What, what, what machines can't do, right? First of all, what they can't do is they can't, they don't have empathy, communication. So, uh, it, it, things like, for example, nurses, right? I, I, would, I would actually argue that uh, doctors are somewhat replaceable. Somewhat, right? Because diagnosis and all these, some of these are even better than doctors, right? This may be, right? Because when you go to a doctor, then it is partly um, transactional, right? Because I want to go in, I get a diagnosis, I come back, I go to the pharmacist. But of course, I think there's a last mile to it. Uh, doctors will always be there because uh, there are a lot of things that uh, the machines can't do, but, but uh, for the sake of argument, or just for the sake of argument, I would think that nurses are totally irreplaceable. Same for teachers, right? Teachers care for students. Well, if let's say I give you a video 
uh, uh, a video training um, uh, or lessons on video. It's not the same, right? So again, if you if you want to think about the kind of career that you're going into, you you got to know that if you if you're in a career of care, then you're going to be good because machines can't replace that. Ah, so critical thinking. This is again uh, uh, something very important because uh, if you go to the courtroom today, there's a lot of technology in there. But it will still be eventually, at least in Singapore or, um, or the UK system, there's still a judge, right? The judge will need to think about all the different things that go into a case and make a decision. So critical thinking is absolutely, um, in, in, at least in this point, I, I think it's irreplaceable, right? In case of uh, decision making, in case in cases of um, uh, complex thinking, where you need to have uh, a range of experiences as a human being before you reach a certain decision. Ah, of course, creativity. So this is the part where is is actually quite difficult. I mean, we will talk to a lot of people with AI. You know, it's quite difficult to to go on creativity. Let's say, for example, um, I think two, a year ago or something like that, I, I watched the. Uh, Japanese show where they were pitching again um, uh, some AI computers uh, versus some poets to do haiku. Right, the results were quite funny actually. <laughs> right, the the haiku, uh, the the they were given a topic, a picture, and then they come up with a haiku. Right, of course, at every point in time, and and uh, at the end of the session, they will have a judge to to say that which haiku is better. Right, almost everyone, the humans won because. Not only because of creativity, because a lot of things are a lot of things that in the, the researchers are programmed into the machine, into a haiku. Um, it, it couldn't relate to a lot of things that is from picture and but this comes with creativity. So if you are in um, a job that needs to be creative, say design, I think you're gonna be good too. Right? So this is a somewhat important strategy, of course. Out of war. The thinking part of, uh, especially let's say for example, um, an entrepreneur, right, things like us, we will need to have a strategy to go into the market. And these are dynamic. And there are a lot of things to really think about. So if you are uh, thinking, if you need to be in a position where, again, transactional, right, non transactional, this is something that you, you will need to, um, occupations or, or careers. That requires critical thinking together with strategy. But the other one is interesting. I mean, technology management because you, with all the robots that's out there, somebody's going to create them and manage them, right? <laughs> so, so IT actually is a very important career, or, or or the I would call the servicing of IT, right? And this is actually one of the main pillars. I I personally feel is very important as well. Now, the other one is physical skills. Uh, so right now, today, I've been pushing my girls, I've got 13 and 16 girls, uh, to, to, to do the dancing, to do the arts, right? Uh, to do things that machines can't do. Um, of course, the other bunch of friends will say, oh, why don't you do, I get them to do coding and all this. But I already know that there are code bots out there, <laughs> right? There, are, there, are, there will be robots who will code better than a human. So I said, hmm, doesn't sort of make sense, right? So. I would say that these are, I would call these physical skills things of beauty. Things of physical beauty, like for example, I, I'm a football fan, I watch football. So I, I watch uh, Lionel Messi, I watch Maradona, uh, uh, things like you, and you appreciate it, right? Or ballet, or the music, or the arts. So these are the things that you really think about, right? And get into, or at least the management of that. Of course, last lastly would be things like what we call unicorn, the, the stuff of unicorn, right? Because we we dream, we dream, machines don't dream, or or at least we I don't think it can at this point of time or at maybe in the last next 30, 50 years, you can't, right? So these are the stuff that is really totally off the charts, that <coughs> is crazy, right? That is non-rational because if you look at it this way. Um, all the machines right now are programmed by somebody. The data that is fed in is fed in by somebody, created by somebody. Imagination and vision and stuff like that is from nowhere. Right? It's not collective. 
so this is this is the key important part where you know the the imagination is really really the most important part. I mean, I, Einstein did say that imagine imagination is more important than knowledge because knowledge there's a limitation to knowledge. But imagination has absolutely no limitations. So these are the seven areas that we really should really think about. I mean, in in terms of um, uh, what we know that the robots can't do. Oh, right now I'm going back to the back, right? Which is wrong. I've got a little blinking thing here. I'm struggling here to to to, to make this stand out. I, I it's also important why I put this is is that you know about technology, you know about the disruption, but you also have a you need to have a very good understanding of the world around you. When I say understanding of the world around you is the things that you might want to be interested in, the things that you want to do. Meaning that if let's say your your the market is going to be Singapore, then it's is that small little dot here. Right? But if you want if you want to look at the greater part, it's a little bit different. Because the problems that we have today here in Singapore is different very different from say in Vietnam or, or in Australia. Right? So so I think is is if you have an understanding of, of what the things that you can offer, what you what are you good at and to offer your particular market or your job scope or whatnot, understanding of the world is important. Maybe not even here but around here. Right? So, so again, you go back to myself. Most of our clients are not in Singapore, right? Uh, we are. We, we've got a. We've got a, uh, a job to do to to develop a data science as a platform kind of thing, but that's not trade off from the Americans, from the US, right? Um, partly is because uh, the market is really there, um, but like I said, we, the, 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 it's the way we position the way we think. So I think have, having an understanding of the world around you. It's very, very important. So I think once in a while, you know, I, I will say this, you have to put your head up and look what's happening in our world, <laughs> right? Whether it's it reading papers or having an understanding. Right? This, that's absolutely critical. Now, just talk a little bit about the jobs that exist and are in demand today, right? I, I just want to, I'll just summarize all these, right? So these are the verticals. I, I, I actually put them as sick care. So, so I don't call healthcare healthcare because healthcare is not really healthcare because only when you're sick then you go to healthcare hospital, right? So that's actually sick care. <laughs> it's not really healthcare, right? But it's going to be very, very, very big. As I would say that it's going, probably going to be number one, right? As our life expectancy and uh, with medication and, and hospitalization and, and healthcare. So we have sick care, pre and post sick care. So I would say pre sick care will be actual real healthcare, uh, which also means wellness. So that market is huge. Um, of course, energy, if you are into energy, I probably won't want to look into anything about fossils. Right? I'll, I'll look into renewables. Of course, tech is important. Advanced techs are the VRs, the robotics, the AI, so on and so forth. Right? And, and data. Content and science. Content means that uh, there's going to be a lot of content out there, but you got you to gotta manage it, right? you got to curate. So this would be uh, this would be the kind of things that yeah they're actually in demand today, right? And and if you and if you really look at it, they are all specialists. They are all specialist roles. Okay, then you think shit. I'm not a specialist. Then what am I going to do? What can I do? Right? Well, uh, you don't. In, in a certain sense, these are the jobs that is in demand today. But you, then again, you have to look at the kind of industries that you're in, right? Is it an industry that is sunset? If you're in this industry, let's say for example, if you are um, okay, for example, in Singapore, you're a carpenter, right? You're in trouble because you're a care and all these things. Then if you want to carry on being a carpenter, then you really absolutely gotta be the best at the best carpenter in Singapore or, or around the region. And you will be the only ones that everybody wants to. <coughs> Which means the, the prices that you can command is much higher. Right? So so again you have to you have to look at your uh, what you are, what you're doing. To be aware of what is happening around you. Um, so these are a little bit more fun jobs that don't exist yet. I got this off the list, and I'm, I was quite. Um, I don't even know what some of these are, right? Um, I don't know what is a landfill worm operator. No idea. I have no idea what these are, right? But some seems make it seems to make sense. Like for example, brain implant specialist. Okay, I, I think it's going to happen. I really think so, right? You have your end of life manager, uh, you know, because that's uh, post post uh, sick care, right? That that sort of makes sense as well. 
uh, and some of the sci-fi, the, the, the um, mm -hmm. stuff that's out there, and, and all these are will probably exist, may not be that name, but it will probably exist. Especially things like, for example, cyber design. It's already happening already, right? <coughs> but but what, what does this leave us? What does this <coughs> really, really, really leave us? So I think it's very simple, right? You just have to learn. More important part, I realized I have to unlearn stuff, right? The unlearn stuff, I think this is this is bigger than any, I think both because a lot of problems here with us as as we go over, like I said, we we have a whole bunch of uh, experiences, and we we sometimes we tend to think our experiences are relevant, but a lot of times they're not, right? It's it's good to have the the experience, right? But we also have to be able to discern what, what experience is relevant and what experience is not relevant and you get rid of whatever that's not relevant and start learning stuff so um, I, I keep thinking I, I keep saying this I think is the, uh, you know if ignorance is not not knowing something is not dangerous because if you don't know anything you just say you don't know and you learn right um, pretending to know something that's absolutely dangerous right and you think you know that's so I think it's very important to, to be able to learn and learn and learn. But, and, but one thing I would really have to emphasize on this is, again, scale and speed. To be able to recognize that things are happening very fast. So, so I think I'll go back, uh, I mean, I'll sort of leave the, the, the tech world and talk a little bit about, you know, what does it take to be successful? So this is sort of my own take on, on certain things. Right, um, and I, there are a lot of stuff out there that says, "Oh, this is successful, and so on, and so on." But what what Mark Sutherland wrote, uh, and a very simple concept, like this is something that I really, really like. Right, he's a former Olympic gold medalist coach. I think first of all, in in the stuff that you do, that you need to enjoy what you do. Right, and you need to be productive as well. So these two are already quite difficult to have these two because enjoying what you do and being productive meaning that. You know, you've got to earn and all this. So most of us focus on this. And and if you ask half the people out here and say, do you enjoy what you do? Chances are I think, you know, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be a yes. Chances are maybe no, right? So having these two is already quite difficult. But but the last thing that I think is very important is something meaningful. Something meaningful, right? So so and this is what it means by a successful career. And I and I, I must say that when you do something meaningful, productive and enjoy what you do, you're, you're not doing a job actually. You're living your life. Right? So this is in a certain sense a, a mode that we are already in. I'm already in and and I'm enjoying what I do. Uh, money is it the most important thing? I think we have enough, so we are good. But but it's it's the pursuit of all this, what it really means, right? It's very hard. It's very difficult to achieve all this at the same time and just to get the small little circle here. But I think it's uh, important in, in what uh, in our in our progression and, and as we move towards our life, right? Um, so a lot of people ask, okay, this is, again, this is my take on the three ingredients of success. Uh, first, I think you've got to have some talent. Everybody, have, we have some talent in something, right? Somewhere, something we definitely have, right? But it's just a matter of one. Discovering it to be self-aware and actually recognize it and use it. And the other one actually is a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. And lastly, of course, I will call this what I call <laughs> dumb luck. Right? This this explains a lot of things. Dumb luck because you know if you can have a lot of talent, you can have a be very hardworking, but yet you're not successful. Why? Uh, I mean, if you're religious, you call this uh, faith, I don't know, or if you're, or, or, yeah, I'll call it dumb luck, I'll just call it dumb luck, because if you're successful and you, you're hardworking, but you just are not at the right place at the right time, no, that, that's, that's life, right? But if you really think about it, what are you in control of? You're probably only in control of this, right? So I, my argument here is that, you know, you, you, when you are doing what you do, you've got to work very hard, right? When you when you work very hard and you recognize your own talent, then dumb luck will come. <laughs> no, because um, it's very simple. It's it's like um, Isaac Newton, right? Isaac Newton he, he sat down the tree and the apple came down and he you, he could took the apple said wow nice apple just ate it 
That's it. Right? But he needed the apple to come down and he needed to work very hard to come up with a better cup. So, so the amount of hard work that's involved in our own careers, regardless of what, whether AI or not, is, is critical. Right, uh, and, and, and what we are talking about is um, something that we, we came up with. What we talked about just now is only our professional life. Right? In, our, in our life, there is seven different elements. So uh, I also hope that you sort of recognize the seven elements of life. Uh, from professional to a family to a health, so on and And in the days, it's only 24 hours. It's, it's, it's really about balance. It's really absolutely about balance, right? And uh, I, I, I would really like you to really consider that um, because in a, in a 24 hours a day, if you spend too much time here, something else is going to do, right? And this is where we think about how you are defined, right? So typically how you are defined uh, by a couple of factors. One, of course, is by yourself. How you define yourself. How you look at yourself. Um, of course, the other ones would be how the world look at you, right? The community, the society, or your family, how, how they define you. And lastly, it would be the things that you own. Sometimes the things that you own <coughs> define you because that's how people see you, right? Actually, if you look at it, this if you look at this, this is the easiest to achieve. Well, of course, you know some argue and all this, but if you target only at this, then you lose this. But I, I would I would say that uh, there's another element, where, which I think is very, again very important that it, it sort of gives you purpose, and I call this true north. Right. Um, so the question here again is, do you know your true north? What is your real purpose in life? So, only if you truly have that, these other elements don't really matter anymore. And because that gives you purpose. And that gives you authentic success. Not just success, but real success. Right? I think, uh, and it's, then the success is really only defined by you and you alone and nobody else. And I, 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 and I think with that, I will just at the end. But I just want to leave you with two things. Right? Uh, this is actually what I have on my desk, above my desk, every day. Uh, this piece of paper is, I think maybe about seven years old, it's been on my desk for a long time. So when I sort of wrote this down, um, my, my girl came in and asked me, Daddy, why do you want to change the world? I struggled with it for a long time. Like she just stood there, I was like, I don't know, I think I can, for the better, I hope. And, and that's what I really want to do and, and in, in the areas that I want to achieve, in the things that I'm doing. So all this is driving me and giving me a purpose, right? And this is sort of the where the, what the true love I'm talking about. And the other one is if you are a CHIJ girl, you probably know this, right? It's uh, Nicholas Barney. So what I'm trying to say here is that the gifts given to you are for others. Um, I think with that, I just want to close that. Uh, you know, the, in the world of AI, in the world of uh, technology disruption, the things are going very fast. But I hope that, that you will have that human element in it and to be able to, to have the word use to prolong the distance between that and the very big button. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Uh, I don't know. Uh, no, I, 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 do you have even time for questions? No. Uh, maybe I have time for one. I, I, I'm <laughs> conscious being on a Saturday that I'm, and hopefully we can get you to stay and, and have some right. food and some networking because there's right. going to be a lot of questions. Um, and what I, I, I took away from this is the the non-technical aspects of your, your talk, actually. Right. You said about all the, 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 the life skills and the personal life. I've got a nine-year-old daughter and you, know, you see when you teach them some sport or some uh, creative things and how much they soak up. And we don't know what jobs are going to be needed in the next few years. And I think that's the thing is that because we don't know, I love the bit you said about you've got to learn, unlearn, relearn, is you cannot be complacent. So whatever course of study, not to, as the University of London, that's what we can offer to help you with, but there are so many other aspects in your life. Networking with people like uh, these guys, like Alex, like Eddie, um, <coughs> ask questions. Don't just assume that, that, that this course is perfect for you or that job is perfect for you because 
uh, the job I do now was not <coughs> 20 years ago, and I guarantee the jobs that those of you are graduating, of, the, the, the horses you're graduating in now, aren't going to pay you really for the next 20 years unless you're actually continually changing. Got time? Has anyone got a burning question? We will all hopefully retire uh, for some food and, and more questions. Has anyone got a burning quick question they want to ask? No, you don't right. want to get between the food. Right. Alex, please stay there. Right. Um, on behalf of the university, thank you so much for coming out on a Saturday. Okay. Let me come around and present that to you. Um, it, it, it makes you think. I think that's all we're trying to do as a university, is make, make you think, you make your decisions, and if we can help, we will. But Alex, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. And we've got an invitation. One more uh, thank you as well to our lovely friends here at Amity for hosting us. Um, I think it's the first time we've done an alumni event here. And hopefully we'll get invited back, so please don't ruin the place uh, and misbehave or we won't get invited back. Um, but thank you very much on behalf of the university for hosting thank us. Thank you so much. Thank you, you're very welcome.